And it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you Roger Slotik. Roger. Thank you, Devon. We were sitting over here a while ago. I didn't know if you all noticed or not, but we walked up the side, and I was sitting over there with those young guys that we just talked here a minute ago. And I won't mention his name, but one of the guys looked over at me and said, you've been up there in front of that convention before. And I said, yeah, about this is about my eighth time, I guess. He said, this is my first time. What happens if you got to go to the bathroom right before you go to the podium? Well, I've been sitting over there for an hour and a half, smoking cigarettes and drank a whole pitcher of water. This will probably be the shortest report in history. I don't know why we do that to ourselves. I do want to spend a few minutes with you this evening, this afternoon, on and giving you a report the, which will be divided in two parts. One of them is what the department has accomplished since we last met in a convention. And the second half is a plan that has been developed by the department and with your approval at this convention or at the end of this report, we will start on tomorrow morning. I got a bunch of staff guys in the back that want to start on it right now. But let me go through the first part and report to you what we have done in the grain department in the last nine or ten months. I'm going to go back to April when the National Board of Directors met in Corning, Iowa and set out a set of guidelines that we in the grain department would follow. And the board made a decision that the grain department would decentralize, move back from the centralized position that we were in in Corning and put the offices back out in the field. They appointed a committee off of the national board of three directors, Mark Rubin, Ed Taverdi, and Jim Buck, and assigned those three directors and myself, Shelley Robertson and Mark Rofing and Dave Schwares, to come up with a plan to make that happen. And they set us four guidelines up that we had to follow. And they informed me very plainly that we would not deviate from those four things. Number one was that we would decentralize. Number two, that the expenses in the grain department would become 100% recoverable. And that they would not accept a budget any longer unless there was showed that there would be an end to the deficit spending. And the last one was to stop the dollar drain on the reserves. I had been in front of those, that board meeting or board meetings for about seven or eight years. And I saw that board of directors with 100% commitment and signed a document to authorize what we're talking about here today the first time I ever saw it. Now, what do we mean when we talk about decentralization? And I know for some of you guys in the grain department that you've heard this, but maybe there's somebody in here who didn't. Decentralization simply means that the bargaining, the procurement, the settlements, the checks, and everything are written out in the country. We were also charged to go out and activate the county and zone committees to serve as people in those committees as the arm of the procurement division within the department. And also that those people on those committees would each month, by the person in charge of that service center area, would know what the standing was for that particular office, what the budget was, if we were on target or below target, and what programs necessarily that we had to make if we had to make some adjustments. And those county and zone people in a lot of these areas that we broke into are now meeting on a regular monthly basis. 
They also set up the board a criteria by which we had to operate before we could open up an office. They said no more betting on the come. You're going to sign up grain and you're going to do it and you're going to work on a cash basis. And they said before you can open up an office, you go out and you raise 33 and a third percent of the annual budget of that office. Not just in upfront monies, we get them by the R6, the VIPs on program marketing, a two plus two contract and a five plus one contract that we've came out with, but that we would not only raise the monies to open the office, but that we would have guaranteed bushels behind us that we knew would come through that facility so we could make it grow. And they said, not only will you get 33 and a third percent before you can open up an office, but if there is any slippage in that reserve, in that local reserve that's set up for that office, I, the director of the department, or whoever the director of the department would be, would give a written report to the executive board or the national board the minute that happened. And they also said that any time one of those reserves dropped below 16 and two-thirds percent of their annual operating budget, that that service center area was subject to closure. Now, these service center areas, they can start out with an office, the minimum requirements are an office, a manager, a computer that's hooked into the home office with a printer on it so the checks can be written out there and we can speed up the movement of this money back and forth. That had been a problem, problem in some areas. And an accountant who can write the checks who can keep the books. It is all monitored by the home office, by the computer, and the people in there. But those areas can grow as big as they want, put on as much staff as they want, add satellite offices, or add other service center areas as long as we can show the board that the volume is coming and that it is in place prior to the money being spent. The advantages of decentralization are simply this. You've got local input from the committees. And we have went out into the local areas in zones, in Illinois, for instance, and had a committee meeting when we was faced with the drought, what we were going to do on a drive. And we went ahead and we kept putting the upfront monies together and putting the bushels together to go after the office. Local bargaining. I believe that you have to have a bargainer out in the country in a geographic area that can watch one or two or maybe three states markets, but he's got to be familiar with it. He's got to know the people that he's dealing with. You have got to have access to him. And he understands that area of it, all being tied together by a national bargaining coordinator who is Shelley Robertson. And to speed up the movement of money, we as grain producers don't sell a, a load of beans or a load of wheat because we want to. We sell it because we got a bill to pay or a farm payment to make. And if it's delayed, it causes us trouble as producers to speed up that flow of that money. The other advantage to this is we have started to trim back on the cost, on the checkoffs of moving commodities through the grain department. When areas are decentralized, there will be a maximum of 10 cents a bushel checkoff, and that includes the reserve, the Iowa Trust Reserve, and all, or the, the reserve and the one third of one percent. The maximum that the producers will pay is 10 cents. And the other thing is that the National Grain Department is on a budget that is at one at this point at one and one half percent of the net. And I'll tell you something. The staff in the grain department, you talk about a bunch of guys that got budget conscious. Now they are. That is, the, I was amazed. I had worked in grain, but to come in and start working with those people and seeing this thing come together, those people are dedicated to making those areas work. And it comes from seeing what you, the people out there, done, doing the drought and so forth by putting these things together. 
You come down to July, and we in the southern Corn Belt in the Midwest got hit with one of the worst droughts, I guess, since 1930. And that's the point I was just getting, that I just made. That's when I found out again what the people in this organization can do once they set their mind to it. In the middle of the worst drought since 1930, you were able to put together four of those service center areas right smack through the middle of the drought area. Ain't nobody said it couldn't be done. Sure, there was planning and a lot of hard work, but you went out and done it. At this time right now, we have opened up a new service center. Now, this has happened since August and September. One in Salina, Kansas. that covers the state of Kansas and Colorado and Oklahoma. One in Fargo, North Dakota, that covers Minnesota, North and South Dakota. There is a satellite office opened at Wheaton, Minnesota, that works with the service over in the Minnesota area. Minster, Ohio, has been opened up. That services Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, and part of the state of Kentucky. David City, Nebraska, which is set up solely at this time because of the possibilities of export of corn and stuff to the, gra to, and to the feedlots and to the West Coast, that office is set up to service just the state of Nebraska alone. Those four offices have been added to Great Falls, Colfax, and Hanford at this point. In Missouri, Illinois, and Iowa, in the heart of the drought area, we, there are funds being put together to put an office together, and I had that meeting down there a month and a half ago with those own people, and they said, we're going to get our office, we'll make it work. We're at the point with the fundraising that we are ordering out telephone lines, a loop line to hook the computer up to. And it was done doing the worst drought that we've had. In Great Falls and Colfax area, we have moved into that area on the decentralization plan within the last six weeks, two months at the most. They have got about 15% of their funds. That was an existing office that had always been there. And we have, go, we have to go into Hanford, California to get that thing taken care of just as soon as we can. Now, with the attitude of the producers in the grain department, within the grain, that move their grain through the department, and the attitude of the non-members, and the attitude that I see when we move those offices out there and open them up, this year, for 1983, the overall final bottom line on the grain department is this, that we have reduced a loss of last year of $2 million. We've been able to re reduce that down to 970000 for this year, for 1983. It's not good enough, but we got it headed in the right direction. We've got an overall 18% increase this year in volume over last year. We managed, with the help of you people out there, and a lot of you were in the rail car meetings that several of us held. We were in the middle of a rail car lawsuit, and by you putting up advanced marketing expense, enabled us to relieve the organization of a $4.5 million liability on a lawsuit that was brought against us by a lease car company and we settled for about 10 cents on the dollar, or about around $450,000. And as I said, many of you sitting in this room were at those meetings and helped to make that possible. The projection for 1984 is this, that I hope by the time we come back here next year, and if you'll help with the program I'm gonna start talking about right now, that the grain department can be very close to if not in black figures going into fiscal 1985. And if we can do that, people, it'll probably be, as far as, as best of my knowledge, it'll be the first time since the grain department was organized that we were ever in that position. <clears throat> now I want to talk to you, I got that done. Now I want to talk to you about something that I hope you'll listen to and that we can talk about, and I'm just gonna go through brief details here, come to the grain commodity meetings tomorrow, and we'll get right down into the nuts and the bolts of the thing. I wanna talk about psychology, marketing psychology and collective bargaining. And I wanna go back to 1982, 
the spring of 1982, I was at home and I was planting soybeans. And I was sitting on a tractor listening to the radio. And we got a guy that comes out of Jeff City, well, he's got one of them farm network deals down there in Missouri and Arkansas and up into southern Iowa. And I listened to this guy and I was planting beans and he was talking about, now he was talking about, the market wasn't there, but he was talking about $6.50 soybeans for next fall. God, I was excited, $6.50. Same guy, two months later, cultivating that same field of beans down in the bottom, listening to the same guy. The crop had been, so, been planted. The government's figures started to come out. Same guy, same field, honest to goodness. Cultivating beans. He said, now beans are going to be probably around $5.50 come harvest time. Cripes all Friday, I'd lost a buck ten cents a bushel. <laughs> Believe it or not, we went into that field. I was listening to him. I was driving a truck. A guy was running a combine ahead of me, listening to the same guy at harvest time. And you know what he said? He said, you're going to be looking at $4.50 soybeans in St. Louis within the next two weeks. And I'd made a critical mistake when I went down to the field that morning. I stopped past and got the expert advice from all the guys at the coffee shop. <laughs> they said they was going to $4 and we got to get out there and get it done. Well, we contracted our beans and I'm trying to make a point. We happened to contract our beans for $5.80, Nancy and I did that year, which wasn't bad. Only problem was it was costing me over six bucks to raise them. And it's ridiculous. But for years and years and years in this country, you and I have been guilty of letting the grain trade and the government and the speculators psychologically talk the market down to us. <laughs> they talk the market up when we're out there planting. And then as the crop goes along, they build up our enthusiasm, hoping we're going to get something. And as the crop goes along, it dwindles down, and by the time you get into the you know, combine to cut the beans or pick the corn, you're so sick to your stomach, you can't even believe you're out there doing it. And we've let it happen year after year. That psychology goes a lot deeper than that. You sit in Corning, Iowa, in the grain department, in the bargaining pit with Robertson and that crew in there, and you watch and you see a 12-line news flash come across the gin machine, a 12-line news flash from some senator or some congressman someplace mentioning the word embargo, and you know what happens to your market? One of those, one day, or in a period of two days, cost the bean producers alone in this country about $40 million in two days. One 12-line news release. Psychology. Markets are 60% psychology. Do you agree with that? <laughs> Those things cost the producers of this country, me and you, millions of dollars a year, and I say it's about time we took and put the shoe on the other foot once. Now I'm going to bore you to death with some figures, but please listen to what I'm saying. I'm telling you the best I know how. The grain producers in this country have got a chance to make something work. Now just bear with me on these figures. And you can take notes if you want to. In 1982 and 1983, I'm using USDA figures. They're not my figures. They're not Robertson's figures or anybody else's at the home office. This come right off the gin machine. 1982, 1983 corn figures, carryover. USDA figures, 3.14 billion bushel. Estimated 1983-1984, the crop year that we're in right now, estimated. 
only 510 million bushel. 314 billion last year, actual, estimated carryover for this year, 510 million. Soybeans, 1982-1983, last year crop year. Carryover, 387 million bushel. Estimated 1983-1984 for this next fall is 140 million bushel. You got an 80% less carryover in corn and you got a 60% less carryover in soybeans. You understand where we're heading? What we can do? And I say those are not our figures. Let me put it to you this way. What I'm really talking about is when we crawl in them combines to go cut soybeans next fall, if those figures are right, if those figures are right, we're going to have somewhere around a 15-day supply of soybeans left when we go out and start harvesting for next year. Think of that. And you're going to have about a 30-day, I'm sorry, 15-day supply of, of corn and about a 30-day supply of soybeans left. Now, do you want to talk supply and demand? And with those figures being there today, available to every speculator and every trader and everybody who's involved in the grain trade, what is happening to the market today? Going down, ain't it? In wheat, you had a 1.5 billion bushel carryover in 1982-1983. For 1983, 1984, they're talking about a 1.4 billion bushel, so you're a million bushel short. Every market, a short of the carryover was before, every market is short and yet the market keeps going down. Are we just going to let it go on? Go back to that drought thing. We had the worst drought since the 30s, USDA figures, and it all depends on who you was looking at, said anywhere in the Corn Belt, anywhere from 48 to 50 percent, right? Loss in crops to the drought. And this year, before we ever went out to, to harvest that disastrous crop in the Corn Belt, the government and private sources came out and for the first time that I can remember said, don't panic, people. Next year, we're going to have a 8.4 to 9 billion bushel corn crop. They're starting the psychology before we ever got this crop out of the field. We got to go all the way and listen to that all the way till next fall. If, if, with the lack virtually of government programs, yes, you got government programs and there's going to be some compliance to them. But I'm telling what I hear across the country and from a lot of you in here. I've seen it happen in the wheat, in the southern corn belt. You had wheat go in because we have to have a cash flow in my part of the country before next fall. So we put wheat in. The pick acres, a lot of the pick acres were tore up and we put in a big wheat crop. And I see the same thing all the way across Kansas, Oklahoma, and up into Montana. And with virtually no program in corn or other feed grains, are we not right that we're going to see fence row to fence row crops next year? If that happens, and if we should get a 9 billion bushel corn crop, everybody in this room knows what that's going to breed. $2 corn, am I right? $5 beans and $3 wheat. Now, I want you to look me square in the eye and let me look you square in the eye and tell me how many of us can stand that anymore. You got an ag debt, and what we're going to propose here is you might get some flack from some people on, but just remember these two figures. What we're going to propose here will work. The ag debt from 1973 was $65 billion. The ag debt in 1983 is $220 billion. The projected gross 
income off of agricultural products is estimated somewhere for this year around $230 billion. We ain't even paying the interest on the debt. So what we're going to do here with your approval <coughs> is try to change that. Now remember the corn and soybean figures and the wheat figures that I gave you and how short we're going to be next year. I say it's time that the American producers, I don't care if they're NFO, Farmers Union, American Agriculture, or whatever. I have been out in the country. I've had people out in the country and we've tested this thing in Illinois and in the state of Minnesota. And what we're proposing is to you, the delegates of this convention, that you allow us starting tomorrow morning to go out and start blocking corn for $4.50 at the Gulf, soybeans for $10 at the Gulf, and wheat, ordinary wheat, for $4.75 in Minneapolis, $4.75 at the North Coast, and $4.50 at Kansas City. And we start turning that psychology around. It can be done. I've seen it done. We've been down the road and we've talked to people and I'm not talking about NFO people. The most amazing thing is happening out there. Talking to non-members. Now, non-members only in Illinois of the available grain that was there, we signed 60% of it and I'm not inflating the figures. The guys are in this convention hall and you'll talk to them tomorrow that we're there doing it. Down the road in a 15 minute contact. In Minnesota, it runs 65% of the available grain that's available. But I'll tell you what, we found out one other thing. That grain is scarce. And I submit to you my personal opinion that those figures that the government and the, and the statisticians are throwing around are as bogus as a $3 bill. with the carryover stocks where we're at. And if you'll get in and help pitch and make this thing work, the whole idea is this. We're sitting at a cash market here. What we gotta do is get a price and start a psychological and a cash movement of that grain on the cash market up. And at some point, if we can do it and stay on it and keep pushing it through this winter, you're gonna see that futures market react and what we want to be able to do is be in a position sometime before we hit the fields and before we got to go talk to the bankers about getting money to go back to the fields is get that futures market to react so we can lock in for something better than what we got now for next fall. <laughs> what we're talking about doing is this. We're going to, from today's market, soybeans and keep those figures in the back of your head of the carryover. Beans, we need to raise them about a buck 50 cents, buck 60 cents at the Gulf. Corn, only 81 cents. And wheat in Kansas City, and that's the only one I got here, was 72 cents. That's all we have to do. Now, it's not going to be easy. It's going to have to take a coordinated effort. But we know how to do that. We have talked to, I have talked to personally, and members of my staff have talked to farm leaders from commodity groups, from other groups, national level and state level, and in some cases, they all agree on what we're doing, what we're proposing to you here today. They agree with it, and in cases, they're going down the road helping us put it together or have made that commitment in some of the states. They said it don't make any difference who does it. We can't stand $2 corn, and that's the general attitude out in the country. We push corn, we'll push beans, and it'll push wheat, but wheat's gonna have to be worked just a little bit different than the other two. And I guess to final, to, to, to summarize, I want you to know that I feel that we've got the staff, and we've got the programs, and we got the attitude is right out in the country to make happen what, been, what we've been talking about here. And as far as I know, I think we got all the nuts tightened down on all the bolts, bolts as far as the department is concerned, and we're ready to go.
I believe that this program is collective bargaining in its purest form. I believe that you as the members can make it work because I've seen you make other programs work. But what I believe more than anything is that we in this organization have a moral obligation to work the prices up in this country. It's the first time, it's the first time that I can remember that you, the members of this organization, we as a group and other producers out there who are willing to help, we have got the trade where we want them. Let's not screw it up. We can make it work. Now, I don't know how to say this any other way, but do we have the guts to do it or not? We must make it work because if we don't, we're going to pass up an opportunity. And I'll tell you what, if we keep passing up, up opportunities to make collective bargaining work, there's not going to be very many of us sitting in this room that's going to be around to enjoy it. I thank you very much for your time. Devon, we'll turn it back over to you. <laughs>